I want to welcome everyone participating to this live event on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So the beauty of being live is that you can actually ask us questions, and you do that in the comment uh, panel. We'll be listening to and looking forward to your question and your comments. So after doing a series of interviews um, about the collapse of our civilization, I really wanted to speak with someone to give us hope, someone realistic enough to see the current planetary crisis, but someone who can direct us toward making positive changes to ensure a better tomorrow. My guest, Navy Raju, will join us in just a minute. He is an internationally renowned French, Indian, and American scholar, an innovation and leadership advisor, and a best-selling author based in New York. Navy's most recent book, Frugal Innovation, How to Do More with Less, was published in 2015 by The Economist, and it shows how companies can innovate faster, better, and in a sustainable manner. Welcome to Back in America, Navy. Thanks for having me, Stan. How are you today? Good, I'm great, thank you. And you are in New York, right? In Manhattan, yes, Upper West. In Manhattan, okay, excellent. So we've got several things in common, I think. Uh, one of it is we are both French. I'm French and I live in the States, in Princeton. And you are also French and you live in New York. But tell me, you've got three passports. Tell me more about your origin and where you grew up. Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up in uh, Pondicherry, which is a former French colony in uh, southern India. And uh, the city was made famous by the book as well as the movie Life of Pi, for those of you who watched it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I went to French uh, high school uh, there, uh, which is the second, I believe, uh, oldest uh, high French high school uh, outside France, I believe, or at least in Asia. And uh, then I came to Paris to do my higher education. And then uh, in 1998, uh, I came to the US to first study. And then I ended up uh, working here. Uh, so I've been here for 20 years. So yes, uh, so I, I hold a French passport. Uh, I also have a, a, a kind of a Indian passport that allows me to go to India anytime. And then in 2016, uh, I got my uh, US uh, citizenship as well. Okay, all right. So you are pretty multicultural. And as such, I think uh, you understand the importance of cultural values and identity, which is what we explore in this podcast, right? Yes, absolutely, so, yes. And, and this is fascinating because we are going to talk about the Great Reset, as the World Economic Forum uh, calls it. And uh, and the Great Reset is really something that, according to, to them, will help our civilization transition towards sustainability. And your research in India uh, and in Europe led you to recommend frugal economy and B2B sharing. This is amazing. And I want to learn more about what it is in just a few words, if you can. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, in a few words. In a few words, in a few words yeah. Yeah, right, right. But I, I guess uh, I have written articles on that, so people can always, you know, look at that. I published an article in MIT, Sloan Manager Revenue. Uh, I just published another article in Fast Company. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about uh, these two concepts that uh, Stan talked about, namely uh, frugal economy, and uh, business to business sharing, uh, I re you can refer to those articles. But in a nutshell, essentially, what I'm trying to do is essentially uh, everybody's criticizing capitalism, but nobody's offering an alternative, right? So, uh, and the brain, you know, according to neuroscience, tends to cling to what is familiar until, you know, we see something new. Uh, so, my job is to introduce Americans to new ways of doing business, new ways of uh, creating economic and social value in a sustainable way. So the frugal economy essentially is a new economy that is built on uh, three pillars. Uh, the first one is uh, business to business sharing. The same way that uh, the last uh, great recession, we saw the rise of Airbnb and Uber, right? The sharing economy among consumers like us. Now we are seeing businesses sharing their resources to each other. Uh, that's very exciting. And then the second uh, pillar is uh, this notion that uh, if you think about from the industrial revolution, right? And until recently, 
we had mass production uh, essentially done in China. And then uh, actually it's happening right now, right? In current affairs, right? Because, you know, China with COVID, we saw what happened, right? The whole sub global supply chains get crippled, right? And uh, so suddenly we cannot even get basic items in this country because they're all made in China. And then we saw what happened in the Suez Canal because not only they are mass produced, but they are mass shipped, right? In big containers. So the new model is uh, thanks to technologies like 3D printing, um, as well as uh, micro factories, smaller factories uh, that are no bigger than a container, it's becoming possible now to make products as close as, you know, to the customers as possible. So we are going to see actually a revival of US manufacturing, you know, thanks to this trend. And then the third pillar is this notion of uh, regeneration. And uh, it's actually the whole notion, the whole idea of going beyond sustainability. If you think about sustainability, it's essentially about saying, oh, we need to do less harm to the planet by reducing mm -hmm. our carbon emissions. But regeneration goes one step further and says, how can we as companies consciously have a positive impact on society and the planet? Um, and we can talk about that as well. Okay. so. If I hear you well, uh, this new model is a way to continue operating as we do today, continuing on the same idea of consumption, production, uh, while having a better impact socially and on the environment. To some extent, yes, uh, except that, as you can see, right, the, the notion of consumption itself changes as well as production. So because the, uh, if you think about consumption, production or supply or demand, right? These are the two aspects of uh, market economy. Essentially it was, you know, people consuming individually, right? That's why in America, not only we call consumerism, uh, but we also talk about individualism, right? So everybody is consuming you know, separately. What's happening, right? In each company producing their own stuff. So the first step is to say, hey, why do we do this in an independent way, right? How do we begin to do this together? So this is called collaborative consumption, which has become, you know, the sharing economy. And now we are seeing the same thing happening uh, in the production side as well. And then, yes, uh, we will, you know, we still have to produce things, right? It's not like we are going to go back to the, uh, the kind of the, the, the becoming like a caveman, right, in the old times. So we still have to produce goods and services. The question is like, you know, can we produce them in a way that um, doesn't, you know, uh, create what we call negative externalities, that is basically doing harm, you know, to uh, society by creating inequality and do harm to the planet, right, and by creating more, you know, uh, pollutions as well as consuming a lot of natural resources. So I would say that, um, it's more moving to a virtuous way of consuming and producing. Um, and then if you keep pushing it further, we are going to go essentially to, uh, and it's happening in Nordic region and uh, to some extent in France as well. And it's also what was happening when I was growing up as a kid in India, is the whole idea that uh, the, the line between producer and consumer would blur. So essentially I can start producing my own goods. Right. Mm. And we're already seeing that. Right. People like, you know, making their own products, uh, you know, with 3D printers uh, and uh, people, you know, of course, we have been, you know, growing food in our own garden. Right. It's the first step. Um, so I think it's going to start that way. Right. This idea of, you know, the old model is like, you know, a few people controlling the tools of production <laughs> and everybody consuming separately to a model where we start sharing our, uh, you know, uh, production tools and, and, and assets, resources in a collaborative way. And people also starting to consume more local, more frugal way. And then potentially we might, yeah, go to a different model altogether uh, where we say, why do I have to buy something, you know? <laughs> uh, right. And and that is something that you mentioned in in, uh, in an article that you published uh, on Wednesday on the uh, magazine Fast Company, right? Uh, where you talk about business to business and the sharing economy again. Uh, can you give us some examples that you've seen from your eyes of companies that are actually doing that? You know, sharing their um, 
their resources, their warehouses, maybe their means of production, as well as their uh, intellectual property. Yes, absolutely. So indeed, uh, and this is why it's exciting because you know we think everything is going badly in America, but actually there are many new startups emerging, uh, which is very exciting, and they are essentially the Ubers of. Uh, a different kind of transaction, right? Which excites me because, you know, Uber is great, you know, Airbnb is nice, um, but these guys, these new platforms emerging, right? Uh, by startups in, not only in Silicon Valley, actually they're based in New York and Chicago, et cetera. Uh, they're helping companies, as you rightly said, uh, to share different things. So I'm gonna give some examples in a minute, but as you rightly pointed out, uh, they help them share, you know, everything from a free warehouse capacity, to idle factory capacity, uh, employees, and all the way to intellectual property. So for example, uh, there is a platform called uh, Zometry. Uh, it's a US uh, startup. And what they do is they connect uh, big uh, industrial firms like uh, GE and, uh, or uh, Dell with small mid-sized manufacturers. As you know, the mid-sized companies in America suffered the most from COVID. And what happens is that you know if you're a large company, and you're trying to make a new product, instead of building your own factory, right? you can actually look into this platform and see which uh, mid-sized company in Ohio or in Pennsylvania may have these highly specialized, right? These are not commodity stuff that you, know, you get from China, right? These are mm -hmm. highly specialized, high value adding uh, mid-sized manufacturers located you know, in uh, Ohio and other uh, industrial uh, states. And, um, and then it, al it allows this platform to electronically you know, uh, share resources. So essentially I design a product and then I can send the drawing to this, this uh, platform and it will optimize the design and then send it to the, you know, the mid-sized company in Ohio and it can track exactly you know, where it is. And if there is a problem, it can warn both parties and improve that, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially, it, it, I think it kind of uh, levels the playing field, so to speak. Uh, it allows basically even the small, mid-sized, you know, family-owned manufacturing companies to be plugged right into the internet um, and offer their uh, industrial services to uh, other, uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies. So that's mm. uh, that's one example I particularly like because. I don't want to get in politics, but if you see what happened in the recent four or five years, right, is we saw the, the industrial belt, you know, being decimated because of outsourcing in America. So this is a way of bringing back manufacturing, right, to America, but we shouldn't bring back manufacturing and make big factories. That's what I'm saying, right? We need to use these platforms to distribute, uh, you know, the supply capabilities across a network of small manufacturers across America so they can also benefit and the local communities, right, can thrive as mm -hmm. well. Um, and then my other favorite example um, is a company called, uh, um, uh, I will come to that later, but uh, since we are in the B2B sharing, during COVID, um, the IT service company Accenture teamed up with um, Verizon and other companies to set up, set up a platform called the People and Work Connect. It's an employer to employer platform that enables uh, employees that got laid off in one company to quickly find a job in another company, right? So in the process, it reduces the long wait period, right? For these people who have been laid off, which is quite dramatic. So that's about sharing employees, right? That's one way to think wow. about it. Um, yeah. And then the intellectual property, uh, it's actually um, companies like, um, uh, it's not American company, but uh, Unilever, which is a big consumer good company, they did something amazing is they developed uh, this proprietary technology to uh, reduce the amount of uh, aluminum used to make the aerosol, you know, the deodorant cans, that reduces the emissions, it's good for the planet, without reducing the performance. And once they develop the technology, they share this IP, intellectual property, with even rivals. Because they say, look, the whole industry has to increase you know, its environmental standards. So we have no problem you know, sharing our intellectual property with other companies. So these are some examples of companies you know, who are beginning to share everything from factory capacity 
warehouse capacity, truck, you know, 30% of the trucks uh, running on highways in America are running empty, right? Mm. So there's a platform called Convoy that actually uh, combines multiple uh, truckload shipments into a single job for drivers, right? So that reduces emissions by 45%. So that's good for the driver, it's good for the economy, and it's good for the planet. Okay, all right. So if I play devil's advocate, um, some question that comes to mind, um, me trying to be suspicious of this model, obviously, is sure. don't we run into the risk of seeing the Uberization of businesses, just like we saw with Uber, that provide great jobs, and I don't know if it's great, but jobs for people who need jobs, but then who, you know, a few months down the road will start to wonder, where is my health care? You know, they are treating me like an employee without any benefits of being an employee. So that's question number one. And question number two is, again, just like we saw with the internet, with startups, with every new thing where we start by going, well, this is fantastic, and everybody is on the same uh, playing field, to, well, in the end, the bigger you are, the more successful you will be. So again, in this new model, don't we run having the risk of seeing you know, large corporation just engaging actively into this model of sharing and frugal economy to make the most of it, crushing other people into no, it, it's, it's definitely, a, you make a good point. As a matter of fact, when I, a couple of ideas here. Uh, when I wrote, so the, the article I published in Fast Company is the first uh, article in a series. And the third article I'm going to publish is uh, uh, showing the difference between uh, what I call smart sharing and wise sharing. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that you're right. Smart sharing is essentially saying we're going to share things only to increase the performance, right, of the economy or as you said, to make more profit for a few companies. The why sharing says, no, we are going to share resources, but for a noble cause, right? Noble cause could be creating uh, opportunities, right? In local communities, right? In the hinterland of America, uh, it could be, and I'll give you an example in a minute, um, a great example, by the way, we'll, it's about improving healthcare, you know, so that Americans are healthier. Uh, it could be reducing uh, uh, damage to the planet, that is why sharing, right? So yes, so so that's why I see. So the problem is, you know, if you only focus on, we say this is the best sharing, right? Uh, what about the other people who say, look, you know, I'm more interested in economic performance first, right? Then I'm gonna think about the planet. So that's why when I write articles, I don't try to pick a side. I say, look, here is a new approach, right? Then of course, you know, what matters is your motivation, right? What is the, you know, Buddha said, right? Uh, Buddha famously said, a knife in the hand of a thief is life threatening, but the same knife in the hand of a surgeon is life giving, right? So, so it's just a tool, right? Everything we discussed so far are just tools. What matters is the intention of the person, right? Using the tool. So. One example I can give you of uh, why sharing uh, is, uh, and, and this is my favorite one because I, I hate the fact that we live in the richest country of the world called America and where, uh, you know, 22% of Americans can't afford still, right, to go see a doctor because it's expensive. So healthcare is a big problem. We know that. And one of the problems is because the, the cost of drugs is so high, right? Many people can afford to buy drugs. So... 1,400, 1,400 hospitals in America who represent well, uh, about 30% of beds, you know, capacity in America. That's quite important, right? They gang together uh, to create a nonprofit called uh, Civica RX. Um, and again, right, these are not big hospital chains. They are, you know, mid-size, you know, kind of, but they come together, right? So it creates, you know, uh, union is power, right? So they pool the purchasing power to... Uh, buy generic drugs that are all made in America. Because you know that in COVID, we found out that actually like, you know, 50%, 50% of the active ingredients used in drugs sold in America are all imported, right? Mm. That's crazy. So these guys saying, no, 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 we are going to make drugs 100% in America, right? And of course, the reason it wasn't made before is because 
if you are a contract manufacturing company, right, making these kind of drugs in America, you don't have enough demand. The big pharma companies, right, they all outsource the manufacturing, right? And the hospitals had no choice then to go to the big pharma companies and say, please give us the drugs. So what ended up happening is that drug prices went up, right, sometime, right? There's a spike, huge spike, which is not good for hospitals. They have to pay a lot more money to get drugs. And as well as the supply was unpredictable, right? If there's like a crisis like COVID, right? Global supply chains are crippled, that's it. You have a short bottleneck and you have a shortage of drugs. So this nonprofit, it's called Civica RX, C-I-V-A, uh, C-I-V-I-C-A, RX. And um, so that's an example of, you know, hospitals sharing not to make more money necessarily, but maybe to save a bit of money, surely. But more importantly, uh, what they're doing is they're taking these uh, off patent uh, drugs that are critical for patients suffering from, you know, cancer, right? Chronic diseases, right? You know, debilitating ailments. And then they can make them in large quantity and share them across the members in this network. So, so you're going to see, yes, you're going to see the kind of the, the bad applications of B2B sharing like Uber, we cannot stop that. But what makes me optimistic is that we're going to also see uh, very inspiring examples of B2B sharing like the Civica RX that I talked about. Right. Okay. All right. I want to uh, sort of come back to the idea of culture and, and, um, and values in this country in particular. And I'm going to refer back to an article you published in uh, 2018, where you wrote that if we want to survive and thrive, we need a radical shift in consciousness. We must learn to value the quality of life over the quantity in life. Tell us what you meant at the time and tell us whether in the last three years your view have changed. Yeah, I mean, the, it's very simple, right? Uh, and COVID actually, that was written in 2018. And uh, COVID happened and reinforced the point that uh, actually I like the term essential workers, right? As you know, we, everybody knows that today. But that's really what I was getting at, right? It's, it's only when we are short of uh, food and medicine, <laughs> as I say, right? You can live without your iPhone for, you know, not easy for young people. You know, you can live without iPhone for many days, but if you don't have water, uh, because I grew up in India in the seventies when we had water shortage, right? So we will have clean water only one day per week, right? So we have to learn to do more with less, less water. And so you cannot live without water more than what two three days <laughs> then you die right so this is what i call back to basics right i think covid you know we talk about it's called back in america right and now we are talking about you know uh, <laughs> back to normal uh, there is no back to normal first of all right we know that we have to accept the fact um instead i think we need to go back to basics reevaluate our lives and say you know uh, will having you know uh, an extra car or you know a bigger house <laughs> will make me happier uh, or is it spending more time with my family? And I think COVID gave a resounding answer to that question, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, and I want to take you on that. I mean, you said there is, there is no coming back to what it was before. I've, I've been really challenged with that. You know, uh, in France, President Macron said there will be uh, what it is, uh, tomorrow won't be like today or something like that. Uh, yeah. And yet we all know, and in fact, uh, we, we know it's already starting, people are just dying to get back into an airplane and, and to start to travel. I'm dying to go back to France. I haven't been back in, to France for, for two years now. Um, so yes, maybe people will remote work more than they did before. Uh, are they really going to change the way they live, the people? Or are we just all dying to go back to what it was before? I'm, I'm not sure about that. Well, I have an answer to that. I mean, uh, that's why I call this uh, frugal economy, right? Is uh, let me start with some statistics, right? So if you look at the Generation Z, uh, our generation, of course, you and I, you know, I think we are financially a bit better off. Let's be candid, right? But if you look at the Gen Z, right? All the research shows that uh, 
they are going to be the first generation which is going to be financially in really bad shape. As a matter of fact, they have almost no savings. They're already loaded with debt, right? So this generation is going to be very frugal. As a matter of fact, you, that's why the millennials, the previous generation, uh, were the biggest customers of the previous sharing economy, like Uber, Airbnb, right? Because they couldn't afford to, or didn't want to actually, right? Own stuff. They preferred to share them uh, as a service. So I think you're going to see essentially what I'm getting at is that uh, uh, there is a socio-demographic shift happening that is going to anyway uh, reinforce these things we are talking about today, right? So because we have the, the young generation, which is more socially conscious, more ecologically conscious, but also <laughs> has less money. I'm sorry to say that, but because right, capitalism depends on money, spending, people are spending, right? So sure, you can get more credit, right? the credit culture you know exists in america but if you look at also that right you see the younger people oh we are losing you on of uh, saving a oh is it back yeah it's back sorry right. you were saying no so we so we are seeing the young people saving more right this is something we've never seen before in america so I think the, your question is like, you know, what is the new? I think the new may not be 100% uh, different um, because the pendulum never swings like this, right? From one sure. extreme to another. So we are going to find a middle ground where um, you might see people. I also died to get on a plane, but I must confess that, you know, I might be flying less because I realized that I can accomplish so much more, you know, by video mm -hmm. now. Um, so yes, we'll go back to some of the older ways of doing things, but there are certain areas where I think things will radically change, um, like the commitment to um, Black Lives Matter, uh, inequality, uh, you know, women, women inclusion and women empowerment. These are things that I think last year, right, became something we can't like, you know, hide anymore, right? These are issues that are, you know, really afflicting American society. So I think you're going to see the social engagement, uh, environmental engagement among companies go up. Uh, but if you're asking me, you know, and and I'm also sometimes cynical, are they going to like stop selling stuff? There is no leave in Manhattan, no. right? And I must confess, and, and you're touching a raw nerve because, you know, up, up to a few weeks ago, right? There was less traffic. I enjoyed walking in the street and within the last few days, right? The traffic is back to the way it was. So this kind of back to normal, I don't want that. So, yeah. but I think the, another way you make me think is that maybe what we will see, the, the changes may not be visible, right? It's not the thing you're going to see in the street. I think what I'm interested, and that's why your program, right, is on values, identity. These are things that are more invisible, mm -hmm. right? People so will be looking for a sense in what they do. That's exactly Maybe right. Maybe more. Yeah. Right. So the changes are going to be within what happened the psyche yeah. of people, right, in the perspective, more than in the behavior itself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, keeping this conversation on culture of value, I want to do two things. Um, pretty soon I will share with you an audio clip from uh, my interview with um, John Michael Greer, who, as you know, is... Um, is a thinker, a philosopher, someone who has um, written a lot about the Great Descent, which is sort of the end of our civilization. He, you know, he wrote that it's going to take a long time, uh, the long descent. Uh, it's going to take a long time, but he sees it happening already, and he believes that our civilization is is drawing to an end. Um, the clip I'm going to play is more about what's so particular about the American culture. And as you listen to that, I would like you to tell me if we if we trust what he says, if we agree with what he says, how do you see this culture, America, embracing the change that you're recommending? All right, so bear with me as I look for this file. Um, and uh, and we are going to listen to John Michael right Not now. Oops. Um, one of the this is Europe is not North America. 
Um, you know, and one of the, this is one of the things that both Europeans and North Americans sometimes forget. In the United States, you know, we're going to be dealing with independence and with that sort of independent minded thing because that's hardwired into our culture. That everybody, basically everybody clings to that and trying to convince people to give it up is not going to get anywhere. So if that's, you know, that's what we have to work with. Obviously, in many European countries, you have a more a more communal attitude. You have a more um, a more locally based, neighborhood based kind of approach to society. Things are there are those connections that are much more closer. There are more um, more bonds between people in specific areas and so on. And so you've got that to work with, and that's what you should be working with. You work with what you have. Go out west, and it's every man for himself. And so, and so here again, one of the basic principles here is that there is no one solution. There's no one way. Right. You, you, want, you want me to comment on it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, that's the, it's a very interesting point that, that John Greer is bringing up, right? Is the contrast between uh, the U.S., which is uh, more geared towards uh, individual freedom, and uh, and Europe and I would even say Asia, right, which is more oriented towards uh, uh, social values and community, community, etc. Um, what if I tell you something? Because that's exactly going to be the focus of my next book on called Conscious Society, and uh, the book actually says, why do we have to choose? Why can't we have both? Why can't we go into a, a kind of a third dimension, so to speak, where we try to uh, integrate? the goodness of America and the goodness of uh, Europe. And both of us, we are French and American, and I'm Indian too. So within myself, I'm trying to do integration. So let me make it more practical. Well, it means that essentially, sure, uh, many people have studied Scandinavia, right? Held as a role model for, uh, for community values and communitarian kind of values, which I admire too. But what has also been studied is how that stifles innovation. Because it's not a society that allows too much individual expression, <laughs> mm. right? So, and this is why I really recommend you to read an excellent book uh, called The Evolving Self by Mihaly Chiksen Mihaly. Uh, he's famous for writing another book, which introduced the famous concept of flow, you know, the notion of flow. So this comes from uh, this author, Mihaly Chiksen Mihaly, but his other book, uh, is by the way is one, is the one of the fathers of positive psychology. So you know, um, okay. so his book is called Evolving Self, and I'm actually using that framework that says that an ideal society is the one that tried to find the sweet spot between maximizing individual expression. So that's one axis, and the other axis while contributing to social integration, right? Because if you go mm -hmm. too much social integration, it ends up being communism, right? If you, if you go too much into real expression, right? Well, uh, it's like cancer, right? Cancer is what? Is a, a bunch of cells going rogue, right? And trying to optimize their individual expression, right? That's a cancerous body, right? And, and so what you need is actually look at the human uh, body, right? Is we have highly specialized cells that excel in differentiation. That's a technical term. It comes from evolutionary biology, right? From nature, where right. everything is different. There's a lot of diversity, uh, but there is harmony as well because they work together. The same is happening you know, in a human body as well. So that is, if you want to look at a new societal model, we should look at nature as well as within our own human body, right? Uh, and I think, so that's what, you know, this uh, book I'm writing about is about. So this is very interesting. You know, I hear you say that um, several things, actually, that maybe this pandemic made us understand, you know, the importance of value, the importance of going back to a more communal approach, the sharing uh, economy uh, brought to a, to, a, to a larger model, to how you can apply that to enterprise and all that. So people people will be looking for sense, will be looking for a way to work together more. Um, what I hear you say also is that the American model um, is one that promotes innovation uh, in itself, in, in its creativity, in the way, in, in its optimism. 
and that if combined with a more European Indian uh, sense of culture, it could be the ideal civilization and it could actually be a more uh, sustainable civilization than the one we've got today. I think it, so. Uh, am, I, yeah. am I sort of summarizing what you're saying? Yeah, that's exactly right. I think, in other words, uh, we shouldn't throw the baby with the bathwater, so to speak, right? And, and I think uh, th that's why uh, when I go to uh, bookstores in America, I'm a bit worried because I see all these titles like, you know, the decline of America and, you know, America is, you know, you know basically like uh, going to disappear, whatever. Uh, and, and I don't think so. I mean, actually, America is able to reinvent itself all the time. And you're right. I think COVID is bringing a new ingredient to the mix, which is this emphasis on community. And um, so this is where I think we shouldn't forget that um, everything we just talked about is connected to politics too, and what we call democracy, right? So that means that what Americans don't like is to be told what to do in a way, right? That's also why I, I'm sorry, but that's that's what I I also don't like to be told. What that's why I've been like a self-employed, right, for 25 years because I like to be my own boss. That's who I am. I'm an entrepreneur. So the question then is, you know. Yes, we are going to have a communal approach, but it should be built on voluntary participation, right? So we cannot force people to say, hey, you know, Tai shall collaborate, right? <laughs> tai shall, you know. Uh, so the question then is like, you know, how do you do that? My take on that is uh, we need to have uh, more podcasts like yours, uh, more positive uh, media news uh, that actually showcase this new America which is emerging. Right, mm -hmm. where essentially we value as much individual expression as social integration. And why I say this is because one of the things I see happening in France when I compare with America is that uh, there is more and more, you know, so, uh, governance innovation in politics. And uh, some of the ideas we talked about today are happening not in Paris, in the capital, but in the regions, right? So the same way what I see happening in America is that uh, you will see a lot of uh, amazing innovation happening in uh, political governance, in uh, social models, economic models, but they may be happening in a decentralized way, right? In yeah, grassroots level. Grassroots level. And America has mm. always been about grassroots innovation and grassroots you know, transformation. And that's why I'm very interested to see is yes, we have a new administration, which is fantastic. They're going to support this transformation, but they can create at best a framework, that's it, right? But then the actual implementation of the changes have to be done at local level, right? And, and so the ownership of uh, driving this transformation has to be completely bottom up. And when you think of uh, the audio clip we just heard by John Michael, you, you know, what are the strengths of the, the 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 key values of these countries that we could exploit to make this change happen. I think there is only one that one value that I I really I know uh, appreciate in this country is uh, meritocracy. Uh, this idea that you know where you come from doesn't matter. What matters is where we are going together collectively. And that's why I, I say these days that uh, America for me is not uh, a place or even a noun. It's actually a verb, right? It, it's a dynamic. And, and you make America what you want, right? And, and so we talk about the freedom. And uh, there is one important freedom is the freedom to be. And, and it took me 20 years to grasp it. Right, and I realized only today that you know, as 50 after 20 years in this country, that my God, that's an incredible freedom. The problem is we don't know what to do with that freedom. So I think Eric Fromm, uh, who was a famous uh, sociologist and psychoanalyst, uh, wrote a book called Escape from Freedom, because too much freedom is also you know um, constraining, <laughs> paradoxically. <laughs> right, mm. we have too many choices. Um, so I would say that, uh, you know, the, the values in this country is about freedom, but I would say in a cynical way that up to now, the freedom was to the freedom to consume. <laughs> um, I think now we should shift into higher gear and think about using this freedom to uh, reinvent our communities, uh, do good in the, plan on, in, the on, in the world, 
Um, so I think this is how we should basically, you know, uh, uh, cherish, celebrate, value this uh, freedom, but apply it wisely. All right. Interesting. I just want to shout out to uh, one of our listeners who is giving us a, a heart from uh, Facebook. Thank you, Caroline. So, yeah, I, I'm still dubious to uh, to see how, I mean, look at what happened on the Capitol. Look at uh, four years of Trump. Look at uh, the mass shouting, shooting recently. Uh, in this country, look at uh, worldwide, look at what's happening in Hong Kong, the rise of populism. I mean, democracy is suffering. Um, right, women's rights are going down the drain. Uh, look at Poland, look at the southern state here where contraception is no longer an issue. I mean, if you want to be pessimistic, <laughs> there are so many things to look at just to 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 to, st to start to cry right um and yet you are here uh telling me that you believe that humanity has a way out of all that doom and that you see example of people coming together to create you know a more sustainable way so what do you make of all the bad stuff that you see around you? How do you explain that? Well, I, I would explain a simple way, right? Uh, it may sound very, uh, you know, hoo-hoo or uh, very esoteric, but, uh, or spiritual actually, is uh, when you see a lot of sh darkness, uh, for me, that's evidence that there is also growing light, right? So that's because it, everything is actually, right? It's called the law of correspondence, right? In hermeneutics, actually, John Greer can explain better than me. Uh, so essentially, opposites coexist. So that means that if you see more and more anti-democratic movement, that means that there's a counterweight, right? There's actually also more commitment to democracy happening, right? So if we see more people actually saying like clim climate deniers, we are going to see the opposite force as well, right? For every action, there's a reaction, right? As we say in physics. So I actually welcome the fact that you know there is so much resistance to change, because that means that there is a counter movement also, right, that I belong to, which is going to double up and triple up our commitment and efforts to change. I think that's really what's happening. Before, right, it was nice to just tweet, you know, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter. I'm sorry to say that, right, or women's right. But now it's going to be about you know, <laughs> roll up your sleeves, right, and get to work. Right? Can you give your life to defend those values? So that we talk about values, right? Value is not just like a poster, right? That you put on your uh, on your house windows, which I saw everywhere in New York, right? Black Lives Matter. The question is actually like you know, how many black people you have in your senior leadership team in a company, right? I won't embarrass a trade organization, in America, which is a very prestigious you know apex body in America. I saw on the website, on the landing page. Black Lives Matter. So being cynical, I went to you know their, um, um, the, 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 the members of the advisory board and the senior leadership team, I couldn't find one black person. Mm. <laughs> so, so, so this is what's gonna happen, right? So it's no longer enough to say, well, you know, we need to fight, you know, uh, we need to fight uh, racism and uh, bigotry and uh, sexism. No, now it's about being congruent between what you say and what you do. And again, coming back to the reason I'm optimistic is that uh, the young people as uh, consumers, employees, and citizens are going to vote with their wallet, with their degrees, and with the vote for those people who actually are congruent between what they say and what they do, whether they are CEOs or politicians or brands. Right. Okay. We're getting at the end of this interview. And as you know, I have uh, always two questions. You started to answer on the first one, which is what is America to you? And the second one will also be um, if you have books or movie to recommend. But what is America to you? 
for me, Amer as I said, America is a verb, right? It's it's what you make out of it, <laughs> right? So so I, I think you know if I were to uh, repeat or paraphrase the Kennedy, I would say like you know uh, it's not about uh, what America can do for you, right? Is what can you do for America, right? So I actually believe America being a, a, a country that I can help evolve, uh, and that's what makes me optimistic. Because it's a country where they don't care where I come from. Uh, and it's fact, it's a fact. In 20 years I've been in this country, you know, I never said publicly, but I'm telling you today, since you're also French, in 20 years I've been in this country, I never heard when a conversation starts, someone asks me where you are from. They may ask me where you live now, but not where you are from, right? But in France, during the seven years I spent studying in Paris, the first question would always be like, you know, oh, where are you from? Uh, you speak French, what's your story? <laughs> so people are asking me a lot of my background and and I hated that. I'm sorry to say that, right? So so I like the fact in America, people don't care where I come from. Uh, they care about where we collectively can go and what role I can play to you know reinvent the American dream to make it more inclusive and uh, more uh, ecologically sound. Um, and yeah, so that's what America is for, for me. Interesting. And... and um... Yeah, I'm really sorry about the comments in France, but it's not surprising. Uh, it's better now. It's better now. I must say it's that better. It's, yeah, it's, it's, evolved a it's lot. true that at least on the East Coast, uh, you you can have an accent like I do. Uh, you can have a, a different color of skin, and uh, people will be less judgmental than they might be uh, in Europe. Any books? Any movies? Oh, uh, the the movie I recommend is uh, because uh, it's called Losers. It's on Netflix. It's a documentary, and it re really goes against this notion that you know America is all about success stories. You know, we highly value the heroes. You know, the people who made it, who are very successful. And as the title says, right, Losers is actually a documentary about people who uh, athletes and uh, primarily athletes actually. Uh, including Su uh, Surya Bonali that our generation, uh, Stan, knows very well, who was uh, uh, a figure skating uh, uh, athlete. Uh, she was black. She was a pioneer in France. And all these people essentially uh, reached the almost top. Uh, either they reached the top, then fell, or failed just before reaching the top. Uh, but actually, the, the film actually shows how failure is the best teacher you can have. And I think it's important for America to listen to that because I think, uh, I believe that, that since 9-11 happened, uh, America has trouble, you know, accepting that, you know, uh, things can go wrong, <laughs> right? And, 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 and be humble enough to learn lessons, right, from failures that are, you know, uh, self-induced or in the case of terrorist attacks, something happens, right? So because you always value things that work, success stories, right, and the heroes, et cetera. So I think Losers is a documentary that uh, shows that vulnerability, you know, is more important than feeling invincible, <laughs> right? Mm. So, so, so that's an interesting uh, documentary. And then in terms of books, uh, I would say that, um, yeah, the book uh, The Evolving Self by uh, Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi uh, is, a, is, a, is a very, very good book. And uh, being a spiritual person, uh, my hometown is the birthplace of a very famous uh, Indian philosopher named uh, Sri Aurobindo. And uh, he has uh, written several books. Uh, one of them is called uh, Life Divine. And uh, his writings have inspired a very well-known American uh, uh, philosopher named Ken Wilber. So, uh, so I would recommend you to look at the writings of Sri Aurobindo with the father of uh, what is known as integral yoga. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Before I let you go, um, if our listener wants concrete proof of something going in the right direction in the US, where would you send them to? You know, who would be an example? Who would embody this positive change today? Uh, <laughs> I may be naive, um, but I think I would look at the White House <laughs> uh, because that's the best place, right? After four years of what we saw, uh, look at the speed at which we are reversing all the bad things that happened the last four years, right? So I'm saying look at the White House not only 
for the occupants of the White House, because yes, I think Joe Biden and also Kamala Harris, right? Uh, electing a woman, uh, you know, South Asian and uh, descent and black woman into, as a vice president, right? So that shows the meritocracy, as I say, right? That's one of the value of America. So I, so I say, look at White House, not only because to show, to see how we are able to uh, bring change into, you know, uh, political governance, but also to see how fast, right, America can change. I mean, you have no idea, um, uh, Stan. I, I'm amazed, for example, right? So I would say two places to look at. White House is one area. And then remember that when I, at the beginning I said, you know, we need to go beyond sustainability, right, to this notion of regeneration. Well, guess which country is embracing wholeheartedly this idea? It's um, uh, America. And there is a famous organization called the Sustainable Brands. Uh, this is a company that, uh, you know, educates uh, American companies how to adopt sustainability uh, practices. And this year, they are massively uh, helping their members uh, to transition to this notion of regeneration. So you can see this, you know, the, the speed at which this shift is happening from the horror we saw in the last four years to you know, taking this country in the right direction. Um, I'm you know, quite impressed. Uh, so I would say, look at the White House and then uh, check out this organization called Sustainable Brands. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is the end of this uh, live event. Thank you for everyone watching. Thank you for your comments. Stay tuned for uh, this live episode, making it to the podcast section. Uh, also, just a brief announcement. You know that I'm working with fantastic interns, and Josh is going to be publishing a new series uh, on Back in America, where he's going to look at poetry and music. So something very different, um, but look for all those uh, great podcasts coming up. Navy, before we go, is there anything I didn't ask you that you have a desire burning of sharing? No, I, I just want to actually congratulate, congratulate you for uh, hosting this podcast, um, because I think we need to, you and I have a moral obligation, uh, you as a former journalist, I as a former analyst, uh, to actually, uh, yeah, bring optimism. Um, because my concern until a few weeks ago was that, you know, maybe Americans were losing their optimism, right? That you talk about the values, uh, more than values, if you ask me why I like America is uh, there is an energy in the air, right? This is crackling with optimism. And I didn't, I, I didn't feel that in the last four years. So I would say that uh, you and I, and I invite everyone actually uh, to spread this optimism around you uh, because that's the kind of uh, the core strength of this country. All right. Thank you, Nevi. Thank, Thank you. you. And goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye for now.